visit with you as I said I <clears throat> came here many years ago for the first time and then I've made several trips back through in this state since <clears throat> and in a sense it's always like coming home when you <clears throat> with other Christians you're never very far from home August 3rd, 1979, a paramedic judged me dead, to be dead, in an ambulance. And for 15 minutes, they could find no vital signs. A tremendous spiritual experience occurred that day that literally allowed me to see the reality and truth of God's Word. As I was given a tour, you might say, of the spiritual realm, where I was allowed to see many startling truths, all of which are in this Bible. They did not show me one thing nor explain to me one thing that I could not substantiate with this word. Everything I saw is documented in this word. As my spirit was carried into the spirit realm, apart from my physical body, the first thing I was allowed to look upon was a panoramic view of a living verse of scripture being acted out before my eyes like a stage play with all the characters. That verse of scripture is Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12. And I quote, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, 
against spiritual wickedness in high places. This is a description of a satanic, demonic government. A government made up of a council at work where the warfare plans are literally being drawn up against the saints of God. If you are a Christian, you're called to war. If you're not a Christian, you're a prisoner of war. Now let's look very careful at this verse of scripture. Who wrestles? There's two participants here. The first, we. We who? We humans? We people? No. We Christians. This was addressed to the church at Ephesus. Only Christians are involved in spiritual warfare primarily. The lost people are not involved but because they are prisoners of war. Luke chapter 4 verse 18 and 19. Second, the devil can take them at will. Second Timothy chapter 2 verse 25 verse 26. Lost people are only used in spiritual warfare when the devil uses them against the save or wherever they can serve his purpose. <clears throat> now, so we have established that only Christians are called to war and we wrestle against an adversary. That's the second participant in this wrestling match. Who is that adversary? It's not flesh and blood, but against principalities. Notice that word is plural, meaning more than one. Against powers, that word is plural, meaning more than one. Against the rulers, that word is plural, meaning more than one. Of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness, plural again, in high places. Your enemy is multiple, but he's not flesh and blood. And the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Now, let's look at that word wrestle. Wrestle. That literally is a sporting term. But why would they give a sporting term to an adversary that doesn't have a sporting bone in his body? If he had a body. But he's a spirit. Now, why did they say it was a wrestling match? That's a sporting term. It's a wrestling match because it's conducted by rules. Not only that, but now let's look at the definition of that word wrestle. That's very important to understand the definition of the word wrestle. There are many words in the human, in the uh, uh, American language, the English language, when translated into another language, change form. There are a few words that have the same definition in every language on earth. Hallelujah is one of those words. It has the same meaning in every language on earth. No matter what language you speak, it means praise God. Praise God. Wrestle is another one of those unique words. It carries the same definition in every language on earth. It has a two-word definition. Wrestle in every language means the same thing. It means contact contest. You're in a contact contest with a spiritual government. Not flesh and blood. You mean that government is going to touch my flesh? It's going to have contact? Yes. It is going to have contact. It's going to touch your flesh. Your flesh and blood 
or your body is, and that's where you're living right now. And that's where the contact is going to take place. Now, this enemy is going to come in contact with your flesh. Now, let's look at this wrestling match. Principality, one of the participants in this fight, is only a territory. It's not a spirit. Principality is a territory. It can be as small as one human or as large as a whole continent, depending upon the threat to the kingdom of darkness. A principality is a simple territory that is ruled over by a prince. Any territory that a, pro or that a prince rules over is a principality. The little country over on the Riviera that Prince Rainer ruled over was always called a principality because the head of the government was a prince. So now we have multiple principalities that are in the spiritual realm that are ruled over by princes. And they become your enemy. These Princes all have a seat upon this ruling council of Satan. They make, they make up the rulers of the darkness of this world. It is there that the plans are literally drawn up against you. Not against the world, but against Christians. This fight is against Christians. They do not fear the world. The Unsaved of the world belongs to them. Luke chapter 4, verse 18, 19. Verse Peter, second, uh, chapter 2, verse 25, verse 26 says, He can take them at will. Uh, Timothy, I mean, excuse me. So we see <clears throat> that this council is determined to obey the instructions of the ruler of the council. Satan himself. No spirit in that spirit world has any authority that's not delegated to him by Satan himself. Therefore, when you come in contact with any of those spiritual warriors, we call them demons, it is just as though you're in contact with the boss himself because they're operating in his name and by his authority. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, he is identified as the God of this world. That word God was translated from the Greek word theos, from which we get our word theology. And the definition of it is divine, ruling, magistrate, high potentate. That's what he is. Divine means anointed, set apart, put above. Ruling magistrate means one who has the authority to control the conduct of those under his jurisdiction. That's why he can take the loss at will, because they are under his jurisdiction. High potentate means lawgiver or rule maker. He's a rule maker of the satanic realm. He is the god of this world. That word world was translated from the Greek word aeon, and it means physical time. His office started with time, it's going to end with time. Until time ends, he rules on the planet earth because he's the god of this world. Did not Jesus testify my kingdom is not of this world. His kingdom is not of this world. We're in an enemy territory. And that's why he hates you. You're not a citizen of this world. You are a citizen of the kingdom of God. If you belong to God, the very first thing he did when he saved you was reach down, pick up your citizenship, take it out of this world, and put it in an invisible kingdom called the kingdom of God. Colossians chapter 1 verse 13. He took your citizenship out of this world. He left you in the world, but not of it. 
that made you hear of all people most peculiar. You become a pilgrim residing in a world you don't have citizenship in. You're not a citizen of this world if you belong to Jesus Christ. You're intruding into the enemy territory and he hates you for it because he has no control over you. He has no authority over you. And when they took your citizenship out of this world, they cut that authority. He brought you out of darkness into light. He gave you just two commands. He set you free. So you were a prisoner. You were a prisoner. Luke chapter 4 verse 18. He said he came to this world in human form to set the captives free. You were a captive. And every lost person is a captive of the devil of this world. You're no longer a captive. He set you free. Gave you just two commands. Now he said, I brought you out of darkness into light. I give you liberty, he said. Take not the occasion of this liberty to stumble back into darkness. This is exactly what he said. That's your first command. The second one was, I took the devil out of your life. Now don't let him back in. That was the second command he gave you. If you let him back in, don't ask Jesus to kick him out. Oh, because he told you not to let him in. Now, he said, I give you authority over him. You're going to kick him out. Now, what is he doing there every day in your life? Jesus said he's a murderer. He's a thief and he's a liar. He lies to you. Why does he lie to you? So he can steal from you. How is he going to do that with a lie? He comes through great deception. Great deception. I bet you don't even know what he looked like the last time he visited you, do you? I bet he didn't have a goatee, didn't have two horns, he didn't have a red tail, did he? You, but you don't even know what he looked like, do you? Well, let me tell you how to see what he really looked like. Look down in deep in your heart right now. Pull out the name of that individual who hurt you last. Oh, you said, that wasn't no devil. That was a friend. That was a relative. Hey, <laughs> look what a disguise. You'll never see him as a devil. You have never seen him as a devil and he will never visit you as a devil. You see, you got a friend that's lost. He can use that friend against you. You got a relative that's lost. He can use that relative against you. It's not really the friend or the relative that hurt you. It's the enemy using him. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 25 verse 26. He can take him at will. This is the war we're fighting. This is the adversary we have to deal with every day of our life. Why? Who is this creature? Where did he come from? Why did God give him that power? Why do we have to fight him every day of our life? Don't you know? Why all of this happened? Why are we here on this earth? Why are we even necessary? When he saved us, why didn't he take us with our citizenship on to heaven? Why did he leave us in an enemy territory? Why did he leave, him, leave us in this world where that enemy could torment us, lie to us, steal from us, and kill us? Why did he do that? Why didn't he take us on if he loved us? enough to save us, why didn't he take us where we would be safe? Why leave us in this territory? Yes, he really loved you. But he also loved them people that's locked up in this devil's jail and he wants to get them out. And glory to God, that's your purpose now. That's why he left you here. Get them out of jail. How am I going to do that? Well, I'm going to tell you how. And the next thing he did for you, I'm going to appoint you my ambassador. You're my personal representative. Go speak to them in the name of the king. 
Don't speak in your own name. And don't serve your own purpose. You're my ambassador. I'm going to tell you what great rewards I'm going to give you for being my ambassador. I'm going to show you how much I love you. I'm not only going to appoint you my ambassador, I'm going to adopt you as my child. Now you become mine. You're in line for the throne. Your royal blood flowing through your veins now. Because I adopted you. You belong to me. Now go out there and speak to them in my name. But, 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 but Lord, <laughs> they, they, they won't hear me. They won't hear you? If you speak to them in my name, they won't hear you? No, they won't hear me. Why? Why one time I went, I went into one of them old bar rooms where them people thought they was having a good time. I jumped up on the bar room and I said, hey, everybody listen to me. I want to tell you about Jesus Christ. You know what happened to me? I barely escaped with my life. They won't hear me. How can I go tell them about you? I'll tell you what I've done too. Not only did I appoint you my ambassador, not only have I adopted you as my child, but I made you the light of the world, Philippians 2.15. Yes. Now all you got to do is shine. Shine so bright that it penetrates that blindness the devil's put on their eyes. When they see me living in you, they're going to hear the words you say. But until they see me, they won't hear a word you say. They got to see me in you. You got to live that life. You got to shine so bright you get those prisoners out of jail. Oh, Lord, can I do that? Sure. All you got to do is learn to walk your talk. Be with your life every day what you say you are with your mouth. And you got a light and a sermon so loud, the world cannot turn it off. But you got to be it. You got to walk it. And then you can talk it. I give you power to tread on serpents. Don't you know that? Why do you lose these battles? Why have you got all these scars? Why? Why? For one reason only. You let him take away the knowledge of your authority and your power. My people perish for one reason only, a lack of knowledge. One reason only for a lack of knowledge. But Father, why did you give me a devil? Why have we got to go through this? Where did he come from? What's this all about? <clears throat> well, child, I told you in my word why it was all necessary. Where he came from and why you're necessary. Why you are the great part of this battle. It's all in my word. Let's go back where I said it children and I'll show you step by step what happened let's go to my word in the little book <coughs> of Isaiah <coughs> you know Isaiah was one of our great prophets and he told you all about me in many ways sometimes the words you didn't perceive that he was talking about what was going on but he was because I put the knowledge in his heart he said in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? The son of the morning did the weak in the nation. How art thou cut down to the ground? What? Son of the morning? In Hebrew, they, they rendered that title, Day Star. Son of the morning, Day Star. What a lovely title. How precious he must have been. For God to give him that name. Thank you. How much God must have loved him. What? He was loved by God? Well, he fell from heaven, didn't he? Isn't that what he said? How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Not only did he fall, but really he was cut down. He was cut down. Verse 13 said, For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. 
wait a minute. He fell from heaven. That meant he had to ascend in there. Well, where was he? Where did he ascend from? Where did he come from? It's all in the word. Patiently, let's look and see. I will exalt my throne. Wait a minute. What's that? He, you said you would exalt your throne? You had a throne? You was ruling already? And you left your throne to go into heaven? Where was your throne? What is this all about? Well, patient. We'll get to it. I got it all in the word. All you got to do, learn to study. Did you know that's how you learn? You study. That's how you learn. All in the word. <clears throat> For you said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. What? You're going to get above everybody there? I will, I will also set upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Well, that's my throne. Well, that's God's throne. You said you were going to take my throne? I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the most high. You declared you would be God. Here was my son of the morning, my day star, who was going to leave the kingdom that I gave you, the kingdom where you had a throne, where you was re ruling, you were going to leave it and come into heaven and dispose me of my throne. The first conspiracy in Scripture a conspiracy of one. No other being was involved in this conspiracy. He conspired with his own heart. What was he saying? I'll be God. I'll be God. What gave this creature the goal to think that he could overcome God since God made him? Here is a creature that's going to turn on his own creator. What gave him the least bit of gall that he thought he could do this? Another one of the great prophets told us. His name is Ezekiel. Let's turn to the book of Ezekiel. And we'll go to the 28th chapter and we'll begin with the 12th verse. Now this is the creation story of this character Lucifer. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus. Here he's called a king. Isaiah called him the son of the morning. The Hebrews called him day star. Here Ezekiel called him king of Tyrus. Look at, but in a minute he's going to identify who he's talking about. And we're going to discover it's not a physical king. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Do you see God made him perfect? The only creature God ever made perfect. He made him perfect in beauty, perfect in strength, perfect in wisdom. Mankind was not made perfect. Mankind was made innocent, but Lucifer was made perfect. Perfect. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardis, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, and gold, the workmanship of thy tabrets, and of thy pipes was prepared in thee the day that thou was created. The gift of music. The greatest master musician the world has ever known. God made him his master musician. The gift of music was made in him. Today, this day, while we're here, he holds an entire generation of humans captive with corrupted music. And they'll do his bidding in the height of that music. The great master musician that God made. But not only that, 
God gave him the Garden of Eden, God's own garden. Not only did he give him that, he gave him a throne to rule there. He gave him all the wealth of the planet Earth. He owns that. You mean to tell me all the gold, all the diamonds, that all belongs to him? It sure does. Well, men fight wars for that. They steal for it. They murder for it. They kill for it. But they can never own it. Never own it. They can use it. They can possess it. But they can't own it. You don't believe it? Go down to the funeral home and watch when they cross the veil. Not one dime goes with them. Not one ounce of gold. It all stays here. Every bit that was created is still here. Not one flake or ounce is left this earth because it all belongs to the God of this earth. And with it, he buys cheaply the souls of men. It, therefore, thus it becomes the lust for it, the root of all evil, because it belongs to him. Every bit of it. Man, don't like to hear that. <laughs> I thought that bank account was mine. Think again. It's not. It belongs to him. All of this was given to him. Well, now, let's see who Ezekiel said he really is. Verse 14. You are the anointed cherub that covereth. And I, God said, have made you so. Oh, yes. You was upon the holy mountain of God. You have walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire are the sons of God. How lovely he was. Perfect in beauty, perfect in strength, perfect in wisdom, and holding the heart of God. He loved him. He was so precious to God. The word Lucifer means bright, shining light. Bright, shining light reflector, not light. When over in the New Testament, <coughs> when Jesus was called the day star, that was an entirely different word. That was a Greek word we know as phosphorus. Phosphorus means internal fire. That's what Peter called Jesus, the light. This character was the light reflector. That's what it is, the cherub that cover it. He was God's own covering. What did God need a cover for? God created him perfect. In our term today, we would call him the CEO of heaven. That's what he was. Second in power and authority only to the very throne itself. Archangel, chief of all angels. Chief of all angels. Second only in authority and power to the throne itself. Dearly beloved by God, so beloved that God gave him his own garden, set him up on a throne in the garden. He left it, he went into heaven in an attempt to overthrow God because he was perfect. He was perfect in beauty, perfect in wisdom. Now Ezekiel <coughs> later on described the physical proportion or characteristics of a cherubim if we could see him. Ezekiel said he stands 15 feet tall. And when his two wings are outspread, it's 15 feet from tip to tip. Head and shoulder above everything God created was a cherubim. That's how big. If we could see him here, 15 feet tall. Powerful. All the cherubims are the enforcers of the giant warring. Uh, from that order came the warring demons, who are also 15 feet tall, <laughs> similar to the cherubim here. Cherub. The anointed, he said. And that is in the present tense. Because Romans... Chapter 11 says, the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. 
Meaning he don't take back any anointing he give to anyone. Even Saul carried his anointing to the grave. David wouldn't touch him. He told his men, you dare not touch the anointed of God. When Saul was trying to kill him, David would not fight, fight back. Because Saul carried the anointing of God and he carried it to his grave. God had to get him killed in a different way. So here, he's, this is the anointed covering Sherah. He went into heaven and he tried to overthrow the throne of God. But he didn't succeed. He didn't succeed. Then comes the second great conspiracy. The first was a conspiracy of one. A conspiracy of one. He thought he could get away, he could do it. But he got there and discovered he couldn't. So then he needed help. And what did he do? Revelation chapter 12, he turned to the angels. And one third of the angels joined him in the rebellion. Wow. Why would the angels join him in the rebellion? They knew there was no plan of redemption. They knew only mankind had a plan of redemption. They, the Bible tells us they desire to look into that. How come you redeemed them lowly little people and you wouldn't redeem us? You made no plan to redeem us. But you have a plan to redeem them. And they were jealous of that plan. But one third of the angels joined him in open rebellion against God. Why did they join him? The answer has to be obvious. God never made a stupid angel. They're not stupid. He looked that strong to them. They literally thought he could pull it off. Now why was it necessary that God left room to doubt? See, he gave those angels which exactly what he gave you, a free will. They had to choose to serve him. Well, they had the right to choose to rebel against him. And they had to make the choice. Just like God lets you make the choice. He gave you a free will. He gave them a free will. Now he had to test them. He tests you. Every time he lets the devil touch you, that's another test. See what you're going to do. What you're going to do. You choose. You decide. Every morning when you get up. <clears throat> today... Well, let's see, I do I want to be a victim or a victor? Well, during the course of the day, you make the choices and decide which one you're going to be. A victim or the victor. You make those choices. God had to leave room for the angels to make the same choice if they wanted to. And therefore, he left room deliberately to doubt. So here, this group thought they could literally overcome the throne itself. At that precise moment, Lucifer lost his title of Lucifer, the archangel. On that moment, he became Satan the devil. Satan the devil. Now Michael stepped up and was promoted to the archangel. Michael now takes two-thirds, the remaining two-thirds of the angels of heaven, and he engages in battle with Lucifer and his angels. And he evicts them from heaven. Where to? Here on the earth. Where they are today. In the power of the air. All around us. Ephesians chapter 2. He is the prince of the power of the air. A misconception. Satan is not in hell. He has never even been to hell. But he's going. He's been sentenced. And he shivers when he thinks about it. That is his final destiny. But right now, he's the God of this world. He's in this world. One day, one time, one moment, the kingdoms of this world are going to become the kingdoms of our Lord. And he's going to give them to you then. To rule over and reign 1,000 years. Until that time, we're living in the devil's world. And we've got to fight him or he's going to destroy us. 
He's going to destroy us because you are a roadblock to his plan. He's after the world. Well, <clears throat> when the angels didn't succeed, when he, with his one-third of the angels, he failed again. Did he lose the war? <clears throat> no, he lost the battle. He didn't lose the war. Michael won a battle, but didn't convince Lucifer that he had lost. He was more familiar with the earth since that was his kingdom. Therefore, he fortified himself, and he's ready to complete the battle. But at this part, God decided the test was over. So God stopped Michael and the other angels, kept them in heaven. And don't worry about going down there. I'm going myself. And I'm going to end this war in such a way that no spirit will ever doubt my ability again. So God came to planet Earth himself. In person. With no bodyguard, with no angels. And he walked in the Garden of Eden. And there he met Lucifer face to face. Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. And he laid down his divine degree that was ultimately going to show how God was going to win this war. He said to Lucifer, now let's paraphrase the conversation, what was literally taking place there. You want to be God. You want to control the keys. You want to have the power of life and death. You want to control everything. Well, I got those keys, God said. Here they are, right here. You want them? You want these keys? You want to control them? Well, all you have to do, you see that little woman over there called Eve? Defeat her seed. Defeat her seed and you win the keys. What? God had now pitted the weakest thing he made against the strongest thing he ever made and he bet the king of heaven that the weakest thing he ever made would win the war. And they're blind. They can't see the enemy. And they're going to doubt him every day. They fight. Because they've got to deal with those physical senses. It's going to try to rob them of their knowledge. God, the angels look at him, no doubt, and they tremble. What is this? Flesh is defending us. That if he defeats the seed of Eve, he's going to win this war. Genesis 3.15. God didn't worry. He said, the seed of Eve is going to bruise you. Now, if you beat it, you got the keys. You become God. That's all he had to do. And how would he defeat the seed of Eve? Just get them to sin. One little sin. That's all he had to do. Everyone had to sin one little sin, and he would defeat them. That's all. Just one little one. Why, wow, Satan relished that. He's got all the wealth of the planet. And don't you know they lust after that? Oh, they lust for that. I, I can buy them cheaply. Some of them maybe for a quarter. Whatever. Oh, he relished that fight. I'm going to be God. He went forward from that moment on, challenging every human being born. And one by one, he got everyone to sin. One by one, he got them all. Till the ark set sail. And on that ark was eight souls. Noah, his wife, their three sons, and their wives. He had come within eight souls of winning it all. But God didn't worry. God knew not eight, but it was coming down to one. The whole battle was coming down to one. And God knew it. And so... The one was going to be named Jesus. Everything was going to be riding on him. This is why he had to be the seed of Eve. Born flesh as the seed of Eve. Just like you and I. Subject to the same temptations that you and I. Subject to the same emotions as you and I. He was born the seed of Eve. The king, the kingdom of heaven... The ruler of heaven depended on this carpenter's son. 
who was born in a little village, unknown. Everything depended on him. Satan watched him every day. Every day from the moment he was growing up. He tried to kill him when he was a child. They had to hide him. Take him out over into Egypt to hide him. Satan didn't understand searched for him. He looked on. for him. Tried to kill him ever. Then the greatest battle ever fought was fought when Jesus, when the Spirit said to Jesus, okay, we're ready, about ready to end this thing. Go down to River Jordan. And there you're going to see a wild man who come out of the desert, baptizing them people right and left. His name is John. You go down there, let him baptize you in that muddy old river. So here goes Jesus, walking out of that dusty village, people sitting at the gate. One said, who's that going there? Oh, you know, that's that Jesus, that carpenter's son back there. You know him. Wonder where he's going. Think he's going up there where all the rest of these people go into the River Jordan. They got a little wild man up there baptizing people and, he, and chewing them out. When they come, he looks at them and squinches his eye and he said, Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come, you bunch of vipers? And he's still baptizing them in the river. And sometimes I think, oh, they have to holler at old John, let them out, let them out. You can't wash it off, you know. But, oh, here goes Jesus to the River Jordan. John baptized him. And when he came up out of that water, a miraculous event occurred that has divided theologians from that day down to this. There was a manifestation of a triune God. As the Holy Spirit came in the form of a dove who lit on Jesus' head and the voice out of heaven says, This is my beloved Son. This is my beloved Son. And you know, a great religion was founded because that occurred there. While they said, those Christians believe in three gods. Because there was a manifestation of a triune God. And therefore, that was one of the, one of the events that sparked the birth of the Muslim religion. Right there. Because... The Christians were, they said, demonstrating their belief in that Bible of triune God. But we know different, don't we? We know it was God in three forms. Now, we don't understand that fully. But now, when he come up out of that river, he didn't go to preach. He didn't go to teach. He didn't go to work a miracle. He went to the wilderness. And for 40 days, he fought the devil in the wilderness. Before he'd ever preached a sermon, before he'd ever called a disciple, before he'd ever worked a miracle, before any of that, he had to meet the devil. Genesis 3.15 was hanging in the balance. Whoever came out of that wilderness, the winner was going to be God. Because that was divine degree of Genesis 3.15. All of heaven watched that battle. All of heaven for 40 days and nights. Something like five verses in the book of uh, Matthew and in the book of Luke relating to that great battle. You see, Jesus went into that wilderness, seed of Eve, son of Mary. Forty days later, he came out, Lord of Lord, King of Kings. He had won the war. Not a battle. He won the war. Jesus won it. The keys belonged to him. Right there. He claimed the victory. Just as God said it was going to happen. Jesus won the war. He used every, Satan used everything in his power to tempt him in that four day. So how did they fight? They fought with swords. You know what the swords were? Words. Word. Satan used the word of God against Jesus. And Jesus in turn used it against Satan. For 40 days they fought with the word of God. This Bible said it is the sword of the spirit. Which is the word of God. And Jesus won the war. It was over. Satan had lost. He was on his way to hell. And the demons tremble. They knew he lost. 
and they was waiting for Jesus to claim his victory. Then a most marvelous thing occurred. Out of heaven came total silence. God never claimed his victory. The angels never rejoiced. They never gave any indication that the war was over. They remained silent. Oh, the spirits in a minute realized that they wasn't claiming a victory. We might win this thing yet. Let's kill him. Let's kill him. Let's kill him. We might win this thing yet. Why didn't God claim his victory? God was after something else. He was after me and you. And it was going to take more than a battle in the wilderness to get us. He was going to trade his son for us. And a horrible death. Nailed to a cross. That's how much God loved us. He was going to trade his son for us. Angels didn't know that. Had they known it, they would have never killed him, the Bible said. But they didn't know it. They didn't know it. So finally they worked their way through the loss till they got him to that day where they could nail him to the tree and they were rejoicing with every hammer blow. They were rejoicing. We might win this thing. We might win this thing. Oh, we still can win this thing. They took him off of that tree, broken, bleeding, and dead they rolled him in the cloth and they put him in the cave they rolled the stone in front of him and they rejoiced they had defeated him but when they rolled away that stone and the tomb was empty their faith was sealed and they knew it he had won the war it was over they were defeated foe Satan looked And he knew he was defeated. Got one thing left. I hate them humans. Oh, I hate them humans because you are what's left of the seed of Eve. And it was that seed that beat him. Now he's going to take his vengeance out on you. That's why he hates all flesh. He's looking for the day forward that he could torture you. He can get you sick and hurt as much as he possibly can. He wants you to experience the pain that he knows he's going to experience forever. For he's been sentenced to that hell. Now, how am I going to get him? How am I going to get him? He shook his hand in heaven and said, I'm going to make them worship me. I'm going to make them call me God. I'm going to make them call me God. Now, in order to do that, that's his last plan. He knows he's defeated. He knows he's going to hell. He wants to take as many humans with him as he can. But he also wants to shake his hand to heaven and say, See, I told you I would make them call me God. And that's his last plan. Now, in order to do that, he's got to have the third conspiracy. Now, let's read about it. See, a beloved child of God who God dearly loved. His name was David. David told us about that final great conspiracy. What was it? Here he had to conspire with humans. Now the conspiracy must pierce the veil. Satan must conspire with humans to capture all of them. So they tell us about it in Psalms chapter 2. Why do the heathen rage? And the people imagine a vain thing. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. There he is in league with the kings of the world and the rulers in the end time. What is his goal? To capture the planet earth by installing a one world government and installing him as ruler over that government. We call it the Antichrist. John said, Revelation chapter 13, verse 7 to 9, he did it. He pulled it off. And the Bible says, in the last three and a half years of his rule, he's suddenly going to publicly declare, I am God. This God you worship is not a God. You've got to worship me and call me God. If you don't, I'm going to cut your head off. 
many humans saving their heads going to call him God. They're going to, and then he'd shake his fist at heaven. See, I told you, I'm going to make them call me God. They're going to call me God. But there are those who would die first. Amen. There are those who will die first. The days of the martyrs are not over. They're quickly approaching. You better know Jesus Christ. For that's the only hope you've got. Don't trust in politics. Don't trust in armies. Don't trust in navies. They can't save you. They can't save you. Only Jesus Christ can. Now he promised to those who heard that he would prepare a place of safety during this great period for those who were awake, whose names were found written in the Lamb's Book of Life. He would make a place of... But he said many Christians are going to sleep into it. They're going to sleep into this thing. And when they wake up, it's going to cost them their physical head because they slept into it. But you, dearly beloved should not be caught that way. He didn't say you wouldn't be. He said you shouldn't be because you have the light. You have the truth. Know the truth and you should not be overtaken as a thief in the night like the world will be. Where is that at? First Thessalonians chapter 5. Verse 4, don't be overtaken like the world. He said, you are the children of light, not of darkness. He said, the world is going to be overtaken, overcome like a thief in the night. The world, the whole world, that meaning all the laws, not a single one of them is going to escape, not a single one. But you, he said, shouldn't be. He didn't say you wouldn't. He said you shouldn't be because you've got the light. Only those who have the light, who know the truth, who are prepared, who understand. So it's coming close. Let's read that verse of scripture. Make certain that I got the right one. I have to try to remember so many verses of scripture. Sometimes I put one in front of the other. And my, if my wife's in the audience where she usually is, she'll holler out, No, wait a minute. Oh, uh, uh, let's get there real quick. I know I got a, two books of Thessalonians in this Bible. I just got to get to them. Uh, I, I, I finally got in a New Testament, so I know they're there. They can't hide long. I know they're there because I read them. I just want to be sure that I quoted the right scripture. I just want to be sure. Okay, here we go, here we go. All right, I knew I'd get to him if I just persisted. Where's that verse, chapter 5, verse? Uh, this is, uh, which chapter? Chapter 4, chapter 5. But other times in the season, brethren, you yeah, know perfectly well that the day of the Lord so come as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction come upon them as a travail upon a woman with a child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. See, he left you with the choice. You can let it overtake you, or you can be wise enough that it won't. It's up to you because you are the child of light, not of darkness. You are the children of the light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For that day is coming. Now, John saw they let him look in the future. And he saw it happen. And he wrote about it. In the book of Revelation, chapter 13, and we're going to read that right where he read it, uh, verse 5 through 7, in, 
Uh, Revelation 13. Let me see if I got it. Yeah, if I get, uh, yeah, I do have a chapter 13 in this Bible. And <clears throat> five through. I think I do anyway. Is that No, that's 12. Excuse me. But I do have a 13. I just got to get to it. Do, do, do. Chapter 13, 1, 2. It was given unto him to make war with the saints. That ain't it, you see. It's uh, seven, not five, but seven and uh, nine, yeah. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all, A-L-L, that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of the life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. On that day, I was allowed to see basically this same thing, but in a different form. I was allowed to see the outline, how he's going to deceive the church. And that's why he says, don't sleep. Now history and all the theologians from time past have told us over and over that he was coming as a great dictator. Not true, not true, not true. This is how he's going to deceive the church. He's coming as a false messiah, as a savior. He's coming as a man of peace without an army. He don't have an army. He comes as the savior of the world. The church is going to carry his flag and beat his drum. The Jews will ultimately call him Messiah. Messiah has come at last. The first three and a half years, he's going to deceive the world by bringing total peace and prosperity. Oh, prosperity. That's what we're looking for. We pray for prosperity, don't we? How do we know this is going to happen? What did he say? I just read to you. When they say peace and safety, Sudden destruction will come upon them as a travail upon a woman with child. But the prophet Daniel had already told us how he was going to do it. Daniel chapter 8, he told us that through peace he was going to destroy the world. Not through war, through peace. Read that. Let's go to the book of Daniel and read that verse. It's through peace. Oh yes, it's through peace that he's going to do this. Not through wars. And how he's going to deceive the church in the world? He's going to bring prosperity. Prosperity and peace. That's what we pray for. Well, we're going to get it. Prosperity and peace. Careful what you pray for. You're liable to get it. And that's what we're praying for, ain't it? Daniel chapter 8. Let's go to chapter 8, book of Daniel, and verse 24. I believe it is. Let's see which one I'm on. Well, I know I got a, 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 a chapter 8. That's in chapter 7. Excuse me. Okay, here we go. All right. All right, let's go to verse, start at verse 23. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences will stand up. Wait a minute. I bet you didn't know that. Did you know Ezekiel said he's wiser than Daniel, that no secret can be hidden from him? What does that mean when he says understanding dark sentences? That means he has the ability of supernatural perception. If they put him in office and he decides to make his headquarters in Brussels, Belgium, New York City, or Rome, Italy, wherever it's going to be, and you sitting over here in Baltimore, Maryland, two or three of you get together and say, hey, come over to my house and let's plot how we can get rid of this character. Well, you're in your closet plotting and when you open the door, there stands his secret police. Because no secret can be hidden from him. Once he's in his office, no one's going to take him out. No army, no nation. No one. 
He's going to stay there till Jesus comes with an army out of heaven carrying a rod of iron in his hand, Revelation chapter 18. He's going to put him out of office then. But until then, he's going to slaughter thousands of human beings. Like the great, great era of, of martyrs under the Roman Empire, it's coming again under this empire. He's going to martyr Christians by the thousand who sleep into his captivity. But if you're awake, if you awake, God said he would preserve you from that time and that place. You've got to know the truth. It's for a lack of knowledge that we perish. Now listen to this. And he said, And through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace, and by peace shall destroy many. He also shall stand up against the prince, and he shall be broken without hand when it's over. In other words, it's not going to be a physical weapon that gets him. It's going to be a spiritual weapon in the hand of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He'd already beat him in the, he beat him in the wilderness. He beat him all the way through. And this is the final battle. This will be the final battle. He's going to put that old rascal in chains one day and he's going to lose his office as a God of this world. Peter said this old world's going to explode like an atomic bomb and burn up. And God's going to build a new one. Wow. A new heaven and a new earth where there'll be no more tears, no more pain, and no more sorrow. For the people who know the truth, please know the truth for your sake. Be on watch. Let me show you chapter 6, what John said he looked like. We're going come to on see the scene. The first description of the Antichrist. Revelation chapter 6. Let's go there. And we will show you what he looks like when he comes to the world. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. That's not Jesus. See, Jesus is described over in, toward in Revelation chapter 18 where he comes with the blood all over him with an R out of R, riding a white horse, leading an army out of heaven. This is the Antichrist depicted here who, who's he depicted at? The hero who comes always. Did you know you, you ever went to Western movies? Ever looked at the, at the theater and see them old Western movies? Or even go back and look at the Robin Hood day and watch all the good guys always ride a white horse? Never let the bad guy get on a dark horse? The good guys are the only one that can ride a white horse. And here he is, coming on a white horse. With a bow, but he has no arrows. With a crown that's showing he's going to conquer the world. He went forth to conquer, conquering and conquering without a weapon. Without a weapon. He didn't have a soldier following him. He didn't have an arrow in his bow. He didn't have a sword by his side. He comes as a genuine 14 karat solid gold do-gooder to save the world. The greatest deception the world has ever seen. Look for him. Be careful that you don't get caught in his trap. My friend, this was one of the things I was allowed to look at. It was an outline or skeleton of this master plan of the greatest deception the world has ever known. We're told in the 12th chapter of the book of Daniel, only in the last day would this truth be real, revealed to God's children. Only in the last day. This is why so many theologians in the past have miscalculated the teaching of the coming of the Antichrist because it was impossible to understand it until God permitted it to be so. And only in this last generation would he reveal these truths. I stand before you and testify 
that what I was shared with you this night was not the result of my theology, nor of some teaching or upbringing that I experienced. As I stand before God with my hand raised to heaven, what I shared with you tonight was supernaturally given to me. Now I come to you as a teller, and I leave it with you. But no matter whatever happens to you, your blood will never be on my head. Because I've told you. I have told you. Now what you do with it is between you and God. Think carefully that you had a God that loved you enough to trade his son for you. How important are you to God? You're an ambassador. You're light. You have royal blood. You're an heir to the throne. That's how important you are to God. He traded his son for you. For you. Who else would do that for you? Has anyone died for you that you know? No matter how dear they are to you, no matter how much of a relative they are, did they put their head on a chopping block for you? Have they gave everything they got for you, including their life? No. Only a carpenter's son who was little thought of in this world. Never attended school that we know of. Didn't have no degrees. Yet the world's libraries could not hold the books that's been written about him. Never had an army. Yet he's conquered the world in one way or the other. And he died for you. For you. How awesome. Our God is. How awesome. He deserves our forever, ever worship. We don't deserve anything. We don't want his justice. We want his mercy. His mercy. If I had his justice, I would be dead and in hell. Praise God. He gave me mercy. He gave me mercy. He forgave me. And in his word he said, Blessed is the man to whom his sins are not imputed. Oh, thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. He didn't impute to me my sins. Praise God. Thank you for it. Thank you for it. Would you stand with me just a moment before I ask the pastor to come and close. My dear friends, I wish I could give you a full paid ticket to eternity. But I can't. Nobody can buy it for you. Nobody can stand in your place that day. Jesus has already taken your place once. And now he leaves it with you. It's up to you. He sent me back to share this with you tonight. And I've done my very best to deliver it as it was given to me. Therefore, all I can do for you is tell you that I love you as my brother and sister in Christ. Therefore, I will pray for you this night. And you just agree with me that God's going to give you the wisdom never to be caught by this adversary. Father, I thank you for these, my brothers and sisters who are here tonight. They come, Father, as the most innocent of all people on earth because they're Christians. And Christians are so innocent, they trust everybody and everything. And they're so easy to deceive because they are innocent. And they look for good, not bad, in everybody. They look for the truth and expect the truth. The enemy knows this. And this is why he's going to come through them with the greatest deception the world has ever known. And Lord, I commit everyone in this room into your hands. And I commit them for safekeeping against that day that's about to come upon this world. And I believe you'll do it, Father, because you said if we ask believing, we would receive. And I ask for my brothers and sisters. What do I ask for? Their protection, their wisdom, and their guidance. The path that you lay for them will bring to them that secret place. Wherever it is, if he has to make them invisible, you can do that, Lord. You can do that. And we know that nothing 
is impossible to your hand. Your arm is not too short. Your heart's not too little. Your hand's not too heavy. And into those hands, I commit, my brothers and sisters, I thank you for the pastor here, for the light of this church, and all that, all of those here who work so hard to keep this light shining. In your precious name, amen and amen. Brother Pastor.